Yeah. You got it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So welcome to the Southern Maryland Audubon uh, program on Thinking Like a Raven. And we have, just a second. Um, let's see. With us tonight is Dr. John Marsliff, professor of the University of Washington College of the Environment. So in, in, 19, in 2022, during the Maryland DC Breeding Bird Atlas survey, common ravens were identified as a breeding species for the first time ever in Charles County and sightings are becoming more and more frequent. Dr. Marsliff is a top authority on ravens and will discuss his research on how ravens behave and interact with other wildlife and people in Yellowstone Park, providing insight on what we can expect from ravens as they expand their range in Southern Maryland. Dr. Marsliff studies the effect of the habitat, fragmentation and increased urbanization on birds. He focuses primarily on corvids, but also worked with falcons and hawks throughout the world. He's written several popular science books about crows, including most recently, The Gifts of the Crow. In recognition of his work, he has been awarded to H.R. Payton Awards from the Cooper Ornithological Society, as well as the Washington State Book Award for general nonfiction. So I'd like to introduce you and uh, to Dr. John Marsliff and have him go ahead and do his presentation. You wanna bring it up? Sure thing. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for coming and listening tonight. Thank you. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to get to the menu, which I can't get to because that message keeps popping up. Uh, I'm gonna have to stop to share a second and come back. Sorry, it's hidden by the... Um, the request to join the meeting so oh that's okay i'll get it over here where i can see it all right now we'll try that again okay is that, that perfect all right sorry about that um i also will just change this to get a Laser pointer, get a little better to point stuff. Yeah, as Barbara said, I'm uh, a professor from the University of Washington. I'm living out in the Bozeman area in Montana now, having uh, retired, semi-retired um, in the last year from teaching. But I've been doing research on ravens in Maine, which will be very similar to what you guys will be experiencing. And also here in the Wyoming, Montana, area that I'll focus on tonight because we've learned a lot about these birds uh, with the study that we have ongoing. So even though it's far away, hopefully some of you have visited the park and um, can relate to the habitats here, but certainly the general theme of uh, how ravens exploit resources, both ours and other uh, species, um, is going to be common to what you're seeing there. And I think you're in for quite a ride as ravens tend to come back to Maryland and reclaim part of their uh, old haunts. I'm gonna take a step back and a wide view for a little while and tell you a bit about the evolution of these animals. And a very important part uh, of the story involves Beringia, the Bering Strait, you may know it as, but this connection of land that happens between Siberia and Alaska um, at times where there are um, large uh, ice sheets, continental ice sheets, like shown here in white, covering the northern part of the world, and that lower sea levels 
And as sea level is lowered, land is exposed in shallow sea areas like Beringia that allows a connection between animals evolving in the old world, uh, Asia, Europe, and those that are colonizing from those places, the new world. And that's the story with ravens and people and wolves. So let me take you through some of the highlights of how we colonized the world and then how um, our activities may have influenced the behavior and abundance of uh, other species such as wolves and, and ravens. So as you know, several million years ago, the genus Homo, our, our genus, was evolving in um, East Africa. And that was the first place that members of our genus had been discovered. We, we may push that number back with time, but right now, two and a half million years ago, first members of the genus Homo uh, were found in East Africa. As we started to move out of Africa, this was a fairly recent thing. Um, the colors you see here, the orange, are where Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, occurred, and uh, other Homo species in yellow, and Homo sapiens, our, um, our species today, is shown by the red arrows, kind of in where we were. Uh, but about two million years ago, Homo uh, neanderthalensis and um, other Homo species were found uh, throughout Eurasia two million years ago. Uh, we were not there. Homo sapiens wasn't there until about um, 70,000 years ago. When we first left Africa, entered parts of Asia and Europe and spread basically to the, uh, to the east, across uh, Europe into Asia, to Siberia, eventually across the Bering uh, Strait, Beringia again here, about 16,000 years ago, maybe as early as 20,000, 25,000 years ago, got into North America and started to spread down uh, to South America where we, we reached pretty quickly about 4,000 years later. Now, along the way, about 400,000 years ago, we started becoming very efficient hunters of large game. Prior to that, we were, we were basically scavenging. We were living off of uh, animals that were easier to catch and smaller and plants, of course. And about 125,000 years ago, there's evidence of Neanderthals um, basically being able to take the largest of the animals at that time, mammoths, and butchering them. So we it came across initially as not very uh, prominent members of the biota uh, and not very efficient hunters. And really only in the last several hundred thousand years have we become efficient hunters. So about uh, during that time, 2 million years ago to about 20,000 years ago, wolves and ravens were also in uh, the same range that we were in. So Neanderthals and wolves and ravens 2 million years ago throughout the Northern Hemisphere uh, in the Old World, uh, working uh, as scavengers and competing with other predators that were there at that time. And the human species were beginning to uh, exert a stronger and stronger influence on the scavenging and predation predator communities of the day of the day as that time went on. This is what the scene would have looked like, say in the two million year ago um, time frame in in a place such as Western Europe. Uh, there were um, Pleistocene uh, biota that were quite diverse. This would also have been seen in North America, where you have our gray wolf, the common wolf we have today, eating larger bison than we have today, uh, and competing with other predators like these dire wolves, a much larger uh, wolf-like animal, not closely related to, um, not in the same genus as wolves, but closely related to them. Well, I'm going to admit Joe, sorry, just to get Joe's out of the way there. Sorry. Um, so about a hundred, about 500,000 years ago, humans, Neanderthals primarily, uh, and ravens were scavenging. They were probably using each other for information. 
uh, hearing other predators at a at a kill site uh, and scavengers that are fighting and going at it like we saw in that image um, that makes a lot of noise and it's an easy signal to pick up on and if you're a scavenger like we were at that time and like ravens were and continue to be you pay attention to those noises they lead you to food and our um, our ancestors and ravens uh, were were following probably those sounds to scavenge at those uh, kills. About 250,000 years ago, ravens were now starting to scavenge from people as well as wolves because people, as remember from the first slide there, were becoming more and more efficient at hunting and processing large game like, like mammoths in particular. And during the more recent times, 50 to 20,000 years ago, Neanderthals were starting to um, have uh, worshiping sorts of relationships with ravens as well. As ravens became very efficient at stealing their food, they also became of interest to people, early people. And there is evidence in, in cave uh, finds of raven feathers that were used as adornments, uh, processed in ways like they might hang on, a, on an arm as an amulet or perhaps as a necklace. And the diets of of uh, early people, Neanderthals and uh, Denis Denisovans, their diets were, were primarily geared to the big game in the area, caribou or um, bison or mammoths, especially in many areas. And the raven diets were looked at about 30,000 years ago, and they match almost completely what humans were eating. So ravens were scavenging effectively from hunters that were both people and wolves at that time. Now, as, as the scavengers were relating to one another uh, and the predators, humans were also affecting those species and none was affected more, more importantly than wolves, which were of course domesticated into the dogs we have with us today. So this is complex interplay between wolves, ravens and people that has been going on for 2 million years among our ancestors and more recently among uh, our particular species. And this is shown as a diagram here from a recent uh, scientific study that again showed these overlaps in raven and human diets that I just mentioned. But I like this conceptual diagram so you can get a feel of as people became more and more efficient hunters, how some of the scavengers responded to that. So initially we're out here, this would be in the, the area of say, uh, 500 to, to a million, 500,000 to a million years ago, when people weren't very effective hunters, ravens and wolves and foxes were scavenging from other predators, those dire wolves uh, that were there that were providing um, large animals for them to, to forage on. As we've moved into a, a time when people became more effective hunters, so again, somewhere around 100 to 200,000 years ago, uh, these mammoth butchering sites came, became reliable foraging sites for ravens as scavengers and also as foxes here, but also wolves were drawn in and, as I said, eventually became domesticated by people. And some of these species, for very close uh, associations with us and our ancestors, uh, maybe even becoming quite tame in the presence of people. Others, not so much. And the raven falls into that category, still aloof on their own wary of people, but exploiting them when it paid for them to do so. So this is what the scene might have looked like uh, early in, uh, in North America, 15,000 or so years ago when people were there, mammoths were still there, people were starting to effectively hunt mammoths, providing them for ravens and other scavengers. Unfortunately, that period didn't last very long. As, as people got to North America, we extinguished the megafauna that was here very quickly. And there's controversy about the role of climate change versus human uh, hunting in driving the extinction of our megafauna. But the fact is from 12,000 to 9,000 years ago, the megafauna was extinguished. Those dire wolves, saber-toothed cats, the large camels and horses, the um, ground sloths, these amazing animals that were very abundant here, mammoths, of course, in North America were wiped out, probably by a combination of climate and overhunting by people. But gray wolves remained, ravens remained, 
And of course, Homo sapiens ourselves remain. And all three species have, have thrived in the more recent time, except where we've extinguished wolves in some areas, but now we've restored those as well. And so that, that's some background that I just want you to keep in mind that what I'm going to talk about today has been going on for a couple of million years in pretty much the same fashion that we're seeing it now in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We're fortunate, fortunate here to have all the predators, the human activity, and the scavenging community is pretty much intact in, in the Yellowstone area. And so we're able to see how things might have been uh, later in the Pleistocene period in North America. So I'll tell you a bit about that, a little bit about raven biology, and then end with concerns for this uh, potentially um, a, not just a scavenger, but predator on some of our other rare species that has led to concerns about increasing raven populations. And just to put that into perspective, this graph shows just for Montana, but believe me, you may be here in Maryland in this part of the graph, but you're going to be here in not too many more years. Uh, mark my words on that. Because this is what ravens do wherever they get a foothold. They are very successful. Their numbers increase exponentially over uh, five or, or more um, decades. Uh, and this is just shown here for Montana in the counts of ravens on Christmas bird counts done by, by groups like yourself, Audubon groups around the world and all around North America. And anyway, the, this exponential increase is of concern for things that are also on the raven's diet, like sage grouse uh, here in Montana. So my collaborators on this project are many, and particularly Matthias Loretto. Matthias is an Austrian scientist, shown here with one of the first ravens we captured in Yellowstone. And uh, he's been studying ravens in Europe. Uh, as I've been studying them here in North America, and we've joined forces studying them here in Yellowstone. Other folks that are helping us tremendously are the wolf and cougar teams, led by Doug Smith and Dan Staler, the bird team that was led by Lauren Walker, uh, the cougar and wolf technicians uh, that, that work to, to gather information on where predators are making kills in the park that we can then relate uh, raven activity to, and to undergrads, especially Cameron Ho and Georgia Coleman from the University of Washington that have uh, been studying the birds here with me. So first off, let me show you how we catch these birds to study them because most of what I'll tell you about today is, is obtained by radio tags that we are able to follow these birds' movements with. So here's a video of ravens foraging on a bit of, um, uh, I think this is a bit of a bison that was pulled out of a lake by by wolves. We have a net launcher by those and we can trigger it remotely. And in this case, we were lucky enough to get two of the birds that we were trying to catch. Once we catch them with the net launcher, we put modern radio transmitters on them. These are transmitters that are worn as a backpack. Here's the head of the bird. Matthias is, is working the harness, which is like a backpack of straps that you would put on uh, that go around the wings of the bird. And this Transmitter is held on the back of the bird. It has solar panels to stay charged up. Uh, we are now in our fourth year of watching some of these birds that we tagged initially. It has antennas that relay information to the cell network so we could track the birds wherever they were going without having to actually find them. Um, now with the conversion to three from 3G to 4G, we don't have that luxury, but we still can obtain highly accurate uh, locational data taken by GPSs that are on the, the um, uh, that, that basically locate the transmitter in, in three dimensions for us. We get acceleration, we get some climatic data, lots of other information on each location that the bird uh, gives us. And most of our birds, we get a location every 30 minutes on throughout the daylight hours. So a little bit about the biology of these birds. Here are two of our uh, birds. You can see a radio tag on this uh, female that's being preened by her mate, a male. They do form lifelong bonds. Males are a little bigger than females. Both will allopreen, we call this behavior, uh, so that they remove parasites from one another. Um, and, and 
basically scratch the itches in places that an individual can't reach on its own, like under its neck or behind its back, behind its head. These birds nest in a variety of locations. I'm sure you'll see this sort of thing play out in Maryland, but we have tree nests. We have nests on human structures under bridges, or in this case, behind this vent um, in Yellowstone where uh, these parents raised five kids stuffed in behind this vent on a building. Um, we also have many birds nesting on cliffs, other human structures like power poles, um, bridges, as I mentioned, are common. And they're quite successful. Here's what a nest looks like. This is actually an American crow nest, but a raven nest would look very similar. Coarse outer sticks on the outside, about a meter across almost for a raven's nest. Blue-green speckled eggs. And a crow nest is lined here with fine grasses and, and bark but a raven nest is always lined with some kind of animal fur. It might be bison fur often here in uh, Yellowstone, although occasionally we've, we've got records of them using bighorn sheep uh, hair and, and deer or whatever is available, elk. Uh, in our study so far, most of the nests we followed have fledged young, at least one, and most of them fledged three young. And this is why their numbers increase so rapidly. When they get a foothold, they usually have plentiful resources and they're, they're pushing out three or four kids every year, uh, year after year. And um, most of those young also survive and eventually some become breeders as well. So breeders have some constraints during the spring and summer. Uh, here's a couple of young about ready to fledge uh, from a nest. They're begging loudly, waving their wings. And the parents come in and feed these kids about every uh, half hour or so, sometimes more frequently as they're this age. And so the breeders are back and forth from finding something to eat, bringing it to the nest and shoving it in these demanding kids' mouths. And so if we look at the locations of a breeding bird and what I'm showing here, and, and you'll see several figures like this, uh, are basically our GPS point locations from our radio transmitters. So this is a bird that nested by mud volcano, it's called, in the Hayden Valley of Yellowstone National Park. And each of these purple dots is a location about a ha every half hour during, in this case, the months of May to August for this female that was breeding here at this yellow spot. And you can see during this time, she only went about five miles away. These points out here, and over here, about five miles away from her nest, almost all of her points, that whole three month period, four month period, were right, right around the nest, very close. And this parental care and this existence of staying close to the nest goes on not only while they're incubating eggs for almost a month, feeding their young for four to six weeks, and then feeding fledglings for another month post fledging. Um, so, during that time period, she, she and the, her mate are very closely tied to the nest site. That's very different when the young is expelled, the young are expelled from the territory, which again is about a month after they leave the nest. The parents no longer are interested in having them around. They boot them out, they're very aggressive, and the young go out on their own. And here's what the same mud volcano female did uh, in the subsequent months. Rather than just staying within five miles of her nest down here, she now started commuting back and forth uh, up to 57 miles away from her uh, nest site in a given day, and then back often that same day, that night, to sleep by her nest again. And her, she and her mate would do this together, this commuting, we call it, back and forth. Not something we expected from a territorial bird, they go and check in on their territory early in the day and late, but during the rest of the day, they're out looking for other things. So why would she fly in that direction? Well, two important things were happening for her. The hunting season was occurring and these are her points. Each of the blue dots is where she was at for a while. Um, she's up here where there's elk hunting very commonly and, and here as well, lots of elk hunting. And when elk are shot, 
as, as our deer back east. Uh, the gut piles are left by the hunters and the ravens are using those uh, resources, much as they used uh, slaughtering sites for uh, mammoths by Neanderthals and other early humans two million years ago. Same sort of thing. She's also using dump sites, places where we had our garbage. Again, the same things they were doing two million years ago, keying in on consistent places here, the Gardner sewage treatment plant and uh, garbage uh, transfer station. And here another set of uh, garbage transfer stations a little further up the road. But again, these are 50 or more miles away from this bird's territory. And yet she knows where they are. She goes and exploits them in the winter time when other resources are not so abundant. So there are two things going on here I just wanna make sure to say, and I will come back to those at the end of the talk. These are garbage transfer stations and also wastewater treatment plants. One of the most common foraging settings for ravens in, in the West now are around wastewater treatment plants where they skim off the fat that floats to the top of our settling ponds and is blown to one side by the wind and ravens reap that high caloric um, food source uh, readily. So that's what breeders are doing. They're raising their young, they're tied down to the nest for half the year, and then they're commuting to distant resources for the other half of the year. Vagrant non-breeders, which are a big part of the raven um, social organization, are doing something very different. These birds are don't have a breeding site, they don't have a territory to return to, and they move around a lot more. We expected this, maybe not quite as extreme as this, but we expected uh, non-breeders to move a lot. And here's one of the birds I captured behind the Lamar Buffalo Ranch here in the Yellowstone National Park. That's the gray area here. So caught this bird here in the winter of its first year of life. And as we put a transmitter on and followed it, this bird started heading kind of north, a little bit east, then, then northwest. And bounced around all the yellow dots here are human resources, agricultural sites, uh, wastewater treatment plants, places like that that it used. And the red points are communal roosts of thousands of ravens on human power lines that we put up in the area. And these birds are perhaps following, this bird is perhaps following others from those roosts up to an area just uh, south of Calgary. And this bird traveled over 700 kilometers in its first autumn of life and is settled in in this part of Canada probably breeding up there. We don't know for sure. We haven't been able to confirm that, but he has been there for several years. Even older birds that are non-breeders and the non-breeding life may last for a decade or more in ravens before they establish a territory. They also wander widely. Here's the perimeter, the red, of one bird's travels over the course of a couple of years. Yellowstone is up here. These are the Grand Tetons down here. Uh, most of Wyoming uh, is, is this part of the map and a bit into Montana here and Idaho. This bird traveled um, a perimeter of 500 or more miles and covered an area of 6,500 square miles during this couple of years of vagrant life. So just to put those some numbers on that for you, these are the maximum distances moved in a day uh, by territorial birds and by vagrants. And we've just split this up by the season. So again, in the summer, the breeding season, territorial birds are mostly within about five miles of their nest at the most on a given day. Whereas in the winter time, they're more like 20 or 30 kilometers on a given day away from their uh, territory. Vagrants, on the other hand, are always about 20 or 40 kilometers away from where they were at the start of the day. So this is their daily movements, 20 to 40 kilometers uh, in summer and in winter. Very different picture than the territorial birds. And again, I would say from everything we knew about ravens, we expected this and we expected this, this movement by territorial birds in the winter being so extreme was unexpected. And this is how they find places uh, like 
um, Maryland and start to recolonize. Most of these would be these vagrant non-breeders that are moving tens of kilometers on a given day or hundreds of kilometers on a dispersal from their uh, natal breeding ground. What this graph shows is, the, is Yellowstone National Park in the dark green and the, what we call the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in the light green here. Just a geographic area that basically is, is ecologically tied uh, together. And all these dots are where our tagged ravens have been seen or we were able to infer what they were eating uh, by staying at a place for uh, at least an hour or so. And what you see is that they're all over the place. Even though we tagged these birds in the park, they are now scattered all over the ecosystem, foraging on all sorts of things. Road kills here in yellow along one of the main roads where elk are often killed. Wolf kills here in the northern range of the park in pink. Agricultural uh, areas in the blue, blue triangles outside of the park and, in, and many times outside of the ecosystem. And insects, these, these turquoise colored circles are insects uh, that are foraged upon throughout the summer. And I can break that up again to show it a little more, well, maybe a little less excitingly uh, here as a graph. But we've got anthropogenic foods, and these include hunter gut piles, road kills, agriculture, and waste at our um, water treatment and garbage disposal sites. And basically, we've broken those up again by summer and winter. And in the winter, they are using anthropogenic foods a lot more than they are in the summer. And in the uh, natural foods are used much more in the summer than they are during the winter. And that's because the natural food that they use the most is what we call here dispersed natural foods. And that's pine seeds and insects and a lot of different sorts of insects. They are really important for ravens. And our birds are probably one of their most common foraging strategies is to be where bison have been and flipping over bison patties that are dried just perfectly to have an abundance of insects within them, larvae of flies within them and insects and, and spiders underneath them that these birds forage on. They also eat carcasses like they did back in the Pleistocene, scavenging from predators, including wolves and, and animals that have died from other natural causes. But one thing to take home from this image, and we'll come back to this towards the end, the use of wolf kills is relatively small relative to things like insects in the summer and waste or hunter gut piles in the winter. Ravens also roost as, as communal groups often or on their territory alone with their mate. And that's this just shows the distribution of where those occurred. And if we look at it just over here, the red and blue, the blue are roost sites by territorial birds. Typically they are piled up. You can maybe see here that there's a lot of points that are right on top of each other here in this particular spot. That's one pair that's roosting there on its territory. Whereas the red dots are spread out, some accumulated in places like here, a spot where non-breeders often roosted, and otherwise just here and there as they uh, traveled through an area and decided to spend the night where they were that day. So vagrants not only are traveling further, but they spend the night in many different places. Territorial birds typically come back to their territory to spend the night. And we did find some areas that were used frequently, we just call them high use areas, but these are communal roofs where many, especially non-breeders would spend the night and sometimes breeders would join them as well in, in those communal roosts. And they might number in our setting somewhere probably on the order of a hundred birds or so. Not nearly as many as went outside of the park at some of these human places like power lines where there could be thousands of individuals roosting together. So the roost site is important because in Maine, we had discovered, Bern Heinrich and my wife Colleen and I, discovered that ravens use communal roosts to gather information about where uh, opportunistic feeding sites may exist. 
And so let me walk you through the basics of this behavior. You may be starting to see this in some of the agricultural settings and forested settings around your place in Maryland. And typically what happens is that the territorial pair shown here is the first to discover a new food, like a dead moose that died of, let's say, starvation over the winter or a predator kill. Then as those territorial birds feed on it, they remain as quiet and they wanna keep that moose to themselves if they can the whole winter, but non-vagrants or non-breeding vagrants are moving through the area and occasionally see these and come in to explore and try to feed but they can't feed in the presence of these dominant birds. The territorial birds are the king and queen of that resource. And as these young birds come in and try to feed, they're attacked. And as they're attacked, they beg, they give vocalizations, begging and yelling vocalizations to indicate they're hungry. Those signals are parasitized by other ravens and you might get five or six or seven non-breeders accumulating at a place here and they can be kept at bay by these dominant territorial birds. Well, the dominance can't keep everybody away from the food. And eventually one of these, one or more of these vagrant discoverers goes back and spends the night with others in a communal roost as shown here, and then flies off the next morning back to that food source. And if you're in this roost and you don't know where food is, you just follow that bird and you end up at the kill. And now when there's more than nine or 10 individuals there, the territorial birds quit fighting and defending and all of the birds forage and eat there together. The dominants still eat more food than the subordinate vagrants, but the vagrants are able to get some food. So we call this selfish, selfish sharing. Sorry, that's a tongue twister at five in the afternoon for me. Um, these birds basically benefit by having others around them, even though they have to compete with them for food, they can at least get in and get a bite now and then. Whereas in this situation, when the territorial pair is dominant and defending, they don't get anything to eat. We were wondering how this might play out in Yellowstone. And again, how it played out in the Pleistocene when we had so many other predators around. So here, for example, is a calf elk, just a few hours, after it was discovered early in the morning um, by the ravens and this bald eagle, uh, this is all that's left of a calf elk after a wolf pack has gotten to it. Not much food. So it's gonna last that day maybe. And there's not a lot of reason to go back to the roost and recruit others because the food's gone the next day. And there's a lot of birds at these uh, places. And we wondered if information exchange like we saw in Maine might've been different here in Yellowstone other resources. As I mentioned, here's the birds foraging at a wastewater treatment plant where fat is washing up in the, the shallows here. There's tourists that feed ravens regularly here and birds have that resource they can go to and not have to, you know, attract others from a roost there. And of course they have garbage as well to feed on. So how do those things work to affect the, um, the ebb and flow of ravens at a kill site here in, in, um, in Yellowstone. Sorry, I have some deer running really fast outside my window and I want to make sure there's not a wolf following them. They're really being chased by something. Anyway, uh, I was watching wolves hunt in, in Yellowstone um, back in uh, 2020 in the Lamar Valley, for those of you who know that area. There was a, a pack of wolves hunting and there was one raven. That's what the numbers in these blue circles mean. There was one raven with it. The, the wolves killed a bull elk quickly and there was immediately four ravens right there with, those, uh, with that pack of wolves. And over the next hour or so, the number of ravens grew to 15. Now that's not recruitment from the roost. This is all happening during the day. The next day, the number of birds increased beyond what I saw the first day up to 23. So maybe there was some recruitment from the roost of these other individuals relative to the 15 that I saw. But then the numbers fluctuate as the wolves come and go and chase them away from the kill. And eventually the food is eaten, the wolves leave, and eventually a day or so later, the ravens leave. So a large bull elk lasts at the most for ravens, really two good days of feeding, and maybe another half a day or so of good feeding, and then it's done. So it, it happens fast. If you're going to recruit, you better do it quickly. 
And there might be some evidence of it here, but there's also a lot of evidence of what we call local enhancement, just queuing in on the local cues, the sights and sounds of foraging wolves and ravens to find these foods. And the birds that find it first are typically the territorial birds that live nearby. 50% of the time, uh, they were the first of our tag birds to reach a carcass, whereas the vagrants were typically uh, not the very first, uh, only about 35% of the time were they the first at a kill. So let me show you what we saw uh, several of our birds do at one of these kills. Uh, an, again, another bull elk killed by wolves in the park. And there are four ravens that are you're going to have to keep up with on these next few slides. There are some green dots of a raven that was over here by Bozeman. There's a yellow dots over here of a bird that was by Billings, Montana. Then we drop into the park, and here's where the wolf kill was, the little um, balloon. And we had two birds, purple and red, who were territorial males that lived close to this wolf kill. So on the day of the kill, the first birds that were at the wolf kill were both those territorial birds, the red and purple bird. Purple lives down here, red lives up here. They're both about a mile or so away when that kill happened. Boom, they were right there that, that first morning. Now the next day, the bird that was by Bozeman decided to fly 140 miles uh, past the kill into Wyoming and then back up to the kill site here where it spent the next uh, day. And the, the fourth day of the kill, the bird from Billings flew a hundred miles straight line across the highest peaks in Montana, the Beartooth Plateau, into that kill site. Now, if you can tell me how that bird knew from a hundred miles away that there was a wolf kill there, I'm, I'm all ears. We have scratched our heads and I'll, I'll show you what I think it is, but I don't think that bird had any idea when it left the, the dump here by Billings and went into the National Park to the Lamar Valley and found this kill, it had no idea it was there. I don't think this bird did either. And in fact, this bird's track shows a little better. It first went above the kill, then turned around, kind of honed in probably on the activity around that kill site. So first off, we know that it's not just birds coming from the communal roost. There is a communal roost nearby that kill site. These are birds that were there while this kill was being fed upon by other birds. And the purple bird did come from the communal roost after it had already been at the kill. It then came in the next day from that roost to there. So we know there's information here that says there's a kill here and this bird was going to it. And it's presumably many untagged birds as well. But there are also the red, the blue, the light blue, dark blue, all of these birds were in the roost and they didn't go to the kill. They went elsewhere that day. So not every bird that's in the roost follows others to a kill. Some go different places. Now, how does that bird that was over here in Billings that made the flight into Cook City, past Cook City over the Beartooth Mountains to find that kill, how did it do it? Well, here's all of its locations for about a year and a half. And you can see that it's taken this flight several different times, coming in here, coming in here, coming in here, and going to different kills. It, I think, is not, it's a, it's a strategy of this bird and other young birds that are non-breeders to come into the park and go through what we call the Raven Highway here, uh, looking for wolf kills. And they fly in the, the most direct way to get into the park and then queue in on local sites. And so it looks to us like it's a straight line, but in fact, they've come in and they probably start sensing the location of these birds, maybe from 10 or 20 miles out and gradually home in on it so that it looks direct to us, but it's probably um, a, a standard strategy that they use. And I would argue that one of the reasons they do this is not to find food to eat, but to find other ravens to interact with. And what you see here are many birds that are displaying to one another. Right here are birds with what we call ears up and pants down. These birds are, are aggressive and dominant, probably breeders from nearby territories that were feeding on this bison. And these birds are in that display posture. Here's another one, here's another one, another, another, another. 
and one down here. About half of the birds at a kill are displaying to one another, showing off, potentially finding a new vacant territory or a potential mate, much more so than they are interested in getting a bite to eat. So social activity, social dynamics are very important to these birds. And um, that's one of the reasons they come in and find these kills. Well, let's talk about some of the individual strategies that we've seen our ravens employ. Um, as I said, some are um, some are wolfers and some are using other resources primarily. This is a complicated figure, but it shows a simple thing. Each of the rows here are one of our tagged birds. We've tagged about 100 birds now in the park. And every one of them has a row that's composed of colors that indicate the kind of food and the proportion of food we were able to determine they were exploiting. So down on this part of the graph, you have birds that have a lot of turquoise. Those are insect eaters. In the middle, you've got the ones with purple. Those are the birds that are eating carcasses and wolf kills predominantly, or at least half of their diet. And up on top, you've got those that are really scavenging from people, hanging out at, at dumps or waste centers or hitting gut piles of hunters. And the different birds employ different sorts of resources uh, for their primary food source. So let's look at those wolfers a little bit. They're, they're in here foraging, in this case, is an elk kill by a pack of wolves, and the wolves defend that kill from ravens, uh, except for when they're sated, then they're sleeping off to the side, and the ravens and magpies get in and have their fill. Earlier studies in the park showed that uh, right after wolves were reintroduced in the um, early 1990s, that uh, about 87% of the time where you saw a wolf, there was a raven with it. And that's very different than the 3% of the time when you see a coyote that there's a raven there, or you see just a raven uh, at large on the landscape. So ravens are clearly associated with wolves. And I saw that in the kill that I described to you earlier. Uh, when they were chasing that elk, there was one to four ravens with them, with that pack of wolves the entire time. But quickly after that, there were many more ravens there. But just because if you look at a wolf and you see a raven doesn't mean that every raven is associated with a wolf all the time. And by tagging our ravens, we're able to determine the proportion of time at which uh, they spend with predators. So of our 69 tagged ravens, 59 of them visited at least one predator kill that we knew of in the park. And this, this graph will show you how that uh, varies for the one vagrant male that visited 54 of those 69 kill sites. So this was the most strongly uh, wolf-associated raven we had tagged. And what we're going to do is show you how often it is within 500 meters of a wolf pack or not. And that's this red line right here. So this is the distance between the tagged raven and any tagged wolf. Um, our colleagues that study wolves have, have some individuals tagged in every pack in the park, and there are about 10 packs. And this line is 500 meters as the distance between the wolf and the raven, between a wolf and our raven. And what you see is that, yes, there's occasionally times when the wolf and raven are very close together, um, 10 meters or so apart here, uh, these green dots. And these green dots are our birds association with one pack of wolves, the Junction Butte wolf pack, which some of you, if you visited the park, may very well have seen. They're very visible. As we go through time on the x-axis here, from 2020 to 2022, we have, situ we have a situation in which this bird is close to the Junction wolf pack on these days and then far away from it, oh, several kilometers away from it. Uh, the next day, and then back with it, and then away, and then back with it, and away for quite a few days. Then perhaps joining, uh, getting close to a different wolf pack here, the light blue, the Rescue Creek pack um, that it was with on some days, and then switches the next day is with the junctions, and then far away from everybody, far away from all wolves for uh, several months of the year, and then winter comes back, and he's close again with the Junction Buttes. And even with the eight mile pack, there's a pink dot right there that's hard to see. 
So what we can take away from this graph is that this wolf, which was, or sorry, this raven, which was most closely associated with wolf kills, did so sporadically. They would be with the pack one day and away the next, with the pack away, perhaps checking in to see do they make a kill or being at a kill with them. And they weren't always with the same pack of wolves. They would be with different wolves, depending. Uh, and this is a vagrant bird. So again, it can move around more uh, and exploit different packs throughout the park. Now, breeders have a bit of a different strategy. Here's uh, the purple uh, dots are the locations of one of our tagged females who breeds over in this area. And she exploited several wolf kills close by. So each of these yellow balloons is a wolf kill. And these big circles, the big dots are colored wolf locations. And the purple with the black center dots are our raven's location. So here she is eating with the wolves at this kill, then over at this kill, here with this kill, up here with another one, and over here. So any kill that happens close to her territory, boom, she was there and exploited that kill with them. But just like with the vagrant bird, um, she's not always with the wolves. Sometimes she's with them and follows them. Here she was flew across the Lamar Valley, joined the pack of wolves here. The blue dot is a colored wolf, as is the pink and brown. And here she is with the blue colored wolf. And then over the next half hour, she follows that wolf to a gully where all the wolves now are, are sitting, probably at a kill there. And she's with them for several hours of the day, presumably scavenging from that kill, and then flies back to her territory at the end of the day. But even she does not stay with the same pack of wolves and with wolves constantly. She'd go out and exploit a kill here and there. But just like we saw with the non-breeder, if we look at the distance she is away from a wolf, and again, here's our 500 meter line, something we consider they know each other or are in the area. Um, what we see is that she's close by to the Junction Butte pack again, which is the pack in her home territory often here during the winter, but then far away from them. Then she joined the Molly's pack uh, for a couple of occasions and then far away from all wolves for, for several months and close back into the junctions and back to the junctions and away and back and away with the mollies and away and now with the uh, rescue creek for a, a day and away from all wolves for a considerable part of the year. So again, <clears throat> they exploit wolves when they are um, in the area, but they're not sitting there following wolves around all the time. If you see a wolf, you'll see a raven, but if you follow a raven, you won't always see a wolf. So do wolves get anything out of this association that occurs between ravens and wolves? We have some way to get at this information. It's not great, but it's the best data we can get to answer this question. And what you'll see here, the yellow balloons now are not wolf kills, but these are places where we had a group of ravens together, a group of tagged ravens for uh, several days. And in this case over here, kills 645, we had two tagged ravens. Uh, these are the, the, the um, identification numbers for them and a wolf from the Cougar Creek pack, the red dot here. So these were together at the same time. And we just assume this is a situation where the wolf teams didn't know that there was a kill, but there probably was because we have a wolf there for a while and we have a group of ravens there for a while. Now, if you look at kill 850, we had a group of ravens there, four of them in, in fact, four of our tagged ravens, but no wolves yet. So here is a situation where we might ask, would wolves that were close by, these guys that are down here, would they maybe find this group of ravens feeding and use that as a feeding site? And what we see is the next day after we have a group of ravens there, the two of the wolves get close to, the, to that place. The following day, so this is two days after ravens had been here without any wolves, we have the Junction Butte pack very close, some of them at that site. The next day, they're all at that site. And then the next day, they leave. The wolves leave. The ravens remain. So we still have a yellow balloon. We still have a group of ravens there. And it looks like to us that the wolves have come in and scavenged probably a, a winter-killed bison that ravens were already at. Maybe the wolves just found it on their own, probably, 
they they could have done that certainly but they might also have been attracted to all the noise of a group of big group of ravens at a kill site like that makes so if we add everything up we have 17 instances where ravens were there before wolves and a lot of instances where they were there together or we knew at a kill site and so we can estimate about a sixfold greater benefit to the um to ravens finding kills that wolves make than wolves finding dead animals that ravens knew about we don't have very many cougar raven interactions but uh, we have had seven times where cougars and ravens were at the same place. And in all cases, the cougar was there first. So ravens were just scavenging from cougars. And we just show that here. The probability of a, of a tagged raven being at a, at a raven or at a cougar kill is pretty darn small. And it's about three times greater to be at a wolf kill or other carcass. So that's a lot of data. So I'll show you a nice little video uh, of a cougar kill. Uh, and, and we can get some idea why cougars aren't such a good provider as wolves are for ravens. So here's the cougar and its kill is down here. And you can tell it's, you can see a leg of a deer here, uh, but it's all buried. It's covered up with straw and grass and all sorts of things to keep it hidden from scavengers like magpies and ravens. Well, our one of our tagged ravens did find this kill. And here he is. You can see the backpack on him. And he's exploiting what's uh, hidden under there uh, by the cougar and getting some food out of that situation. But that's rare relative to having a raven at a wolf kill. So what about other uh, sources of uh, food and uh, really different strategies used by our ravens? And I'm sure some of these are the ones you'll be seeing as well. In Yellowstone, <clears throat> tourists can't help but feed ravens. They, they come right up to your car. They look at you like a little puppy. They uh, wait for a handout. And this guy tossed this bird a ham sandwich shortly after I took this picture. And some of our birds are quite adept at begging. One in particular whose name was Steve, although Steve, we later confirmed, was a female. Um, so Stevie, perhaps, is a better term for this bird. Stevie uh, lived up in Cook City, Montana, which is on the northeastern edge of Yellowstone. I tagged her up in, in Cook City and came to find out that she was a favorite bird of the citizens of Cook City. She had a bit of a crippled foot and this, before I tagged her, and the citizens there had adopted her as their mascot. And this one in particular that you see uh, would routinely bring food out uh, for Stevie. And um, she and her husband were afraid of Stevie's pounding on the window that's so loud and so hard that, she, that Stevie might break the window that they hung this bell out. And Stevie learned to ring the bell to get um, the, the owners to come out and give her leftover roast beef or, or tortillas or whatever it might have been. Well, I was lucky in this case uh, to, to be able to find out about CV because the people of Cook City were not happy to discover their mascot had been captured and tagged with these leg bands that I put on the bird and the backpack uh, that she has for her transmitter. Fortunately, I just by random chance uh, tagged this bird blue and white. And um, that's fortunate because the husband of Molly that you see here in the window uh, is a Kentucky Wildcat fan. And he was ready to take the bands off of this bird until he realized, hey, they're the colors of the Kentucky Wildcats, University of Kentucky. So he let the let my tag stay on. And I was fortunate because we were able to learn a lot about this bird and show Nick and Molly what this bird was doing. And here are the locations. Here are the dark areas, Cook City, uh, where this bird, of course, spends a lot of time. But she flies 100 miles away, down to Cody, Wyoming, up into parts of Montana, covers a large area. Sometimes she, we notice her concentration in places like around this lake, up in the Beartooth Wilderness above Cook City, and wondered what she might be doing down there. Well, as I looked at the image more closely, I saw there was a cabin underneath those those that cluster of her points. 
And about the same time, we got an email from a lawyer asking for a friend of his if we knew anything about a tagged raven that, that was hanging out at his cabin. So it turns out that Stevie had gone up to this cabin and we followed uh, Stevie to figure out uh, what was going on there. Kind of figured that this was probably quite an interesting guy that was living up here in the wilderness uh, in this cabin. So uh, Colleen and our dogs and myself hiked in and we found this guy feeding Stevie at an, a different location. And it turned out this was the former Lieutenant Governor of South Dakota. So a guy that had uh, formed quite a tight association with this bird, much as Molly and Nick had done in Cook City. And Stevie was the was just the greatest um, exploiter of people we, we have seen. She basically spent all of her time finding different people that would provide food for her and, and uh, did quite well in so doing. She remained a vagrant non-breeder Maybe she was more closely bound to these people than, than to another raven. Well, some ravens are thieves. They'll rip into backpacks. This is one doing this in the Grand Canyon, but they'll, they'll rifle through backpacks and saddlebags of snowmobiles looking for food that tourists might have uh, left unattended. So I went into Old Faithful to try to get a better look at this. And uh, what I found was a few of our birds that, that live in Old Faithful, here are their points, two territorial birds that take the area there and they certainly exploit people. Um, they had not been able to get into the new saddlebags that we have on uh, snowmobiles now. These are locking. They used to be uh, canvas bags that had Velcro enclosures that the ravens could rip open, kind of like they were unzipping that backpack. And the ravens can't get into these now. We've stopped them from being able to get into that food source. The ravens aren't happy about this. And if you look at the seat, you see this white spot. This isn't feces. This is a torn, this is an area that ravens have torn into the seat cover and started ripping the foam out of this brand new snowmobile um, to, to maybe just let people know, hey, we're not happy with the fact that, that we're not getting food from you anymore. And this kind of arms race where we come up with a strategy to keep them out of something, the ravens come back with something else, is what we call cultural coevolution. So the learned behavior of ravens is evolving in response to our uh, learned behavior. And again, this is not something new. This is something that ravens have been doing forever. Two million years ago in the Pleistocene with other predators and in modern time, uh, in places like Maryland, where you've named uh, your football team after the the Ravens, um, and other places where they've influenced our language, beliefs, dances, culture, and pop culture today. So let's just return to, to finish up reconsidering this exponential growth that Ravens can incur because of all the food sources that they get. And again, remember the food sources I've been emphasizing scavenging from predators, but really relying upon people, even going to extremes of, of basically living with people and, and getting fed by them daily, even though they're wild birds that are out doing their thing. Um, as their numbers increase, they also are not just scavengers, they're predators on baby tortoises, small birds and eggs. And that's been a concern for these three rare species, snowy plover on the West Coast, desert tortoise in the Mojave and greater sage grouse throughout the Western US. Well, the response of the US government has been to kill ravens. So this is the number of ravens killed every year from 95 to 2020 by the, fish, the US uh, Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services. And right now we're killing about 10,000 ravens every year which isn't having any effect on ravens. If you recall this graph, the ravens are still increasing, the rare species are still decreasing, and we're just killing a lot of ravens like the same outfit kills lots of coyotes every year. It may make somebody feel good for like uh, having an effect, but it's pretty ineffectual at controlling an exponentially increasing population. Our study has suggested that it would be much more sustainable to first control the resources, the garbage dumps, the water treatment plants, the hunting areas that uh, gut piles are left out in. Control those resources if they are close by to a sensitive species 
so that ravens aren't attracted there. They won't even be there if those resources aren't there. And then if there are some habitual killers that need to be lethally removed, it would be more effective. But to just kill 10,000 ravens a year isn't, isn't um, ethical and it's not um, practical. So I'm sorry I took a little, uh, little more time there, but uh, if you're interested in keeping up with our science, you can go to the Avian Conservation Lab website at the University of Washington. You could check out some of the books that were mentioned uh, that I've done on ravens and birds in suburban lands or agricultural lands. Um, and you can keep up with our tag birds in Yellowstone by getting a free app called Animal Tracker that'll show you where the tag birds are on a given day. Or if you're interested more in crows, another free app that my wife and I did with some gamers here in the Seattle area is called Crow Scientist. And you can download that and learn a bit about the vocalizations and behaviors of crows um, in your area as well. So with that, I will stop sharing. <clears throat> and if you're still awake and out there, I'm glad to take some questions. Thank you. That was very interesting. And we do have some questions we want to uh, pose to you here that are on the chat. Annette, are you, are you still on? I am. Do you want to help him with the questions? I can absolutely do that. Let me pull them up. We had several good ones. I know the first one is from Marion Starr. How heavy is the backpack transmitter? And also, do members of a raven family ever try to remove it off of another bird? Yeah, good good question. Um, let me get some light on in here so you guys can see me. It's gotten dark here. Um, the backpacks <clears throat> that we put on are three at the most 3% of the body weight of the birds. That's a limit that we have set by um, various... Um, other studies done to show when there is or isn't much of an effect, but certainly putting a backpack on a bird is always a um, difficult decision. We know it has some effect on the birds. We hope it doesn't affect them in a way that compromises what we're trying to find out about them, their movements, their breeding success, things like that, that are important for the bird as well. We don't think ours do, but we're continually assessing their uh, reproduction uh, relative to untagged birds as well to try to understand better what, what might be happening. But as you can see, they can certainly cover big distances carrying that weight. <clears throat> and as far as other birds taking them off, we have had several of the backpacks broken uh, at one uh, of the attachment points, which I don't think it the bird wearing it could do. It would have to turn its head around and grab that air, that tag with its beak and twist it in such a way to break it and then get out. I think it probably is its mate uh, or another bird while they're preening that feel that tag and start manipulating it and eventually can break it off. So um, it's, I think, very possible. And it has been shown in some other species of corvids that, that they will do this. Fortunately, it doesn't happen very frequently with ours, so we still get lots of information and learn more and more about these birds uh, every day as they wear these tags. Awesome, thank you. And I believe you may have answered this one at least in part. Lisa Garrett is asking how many birds are banded. Um, she's commenting that she saw the yellow bands and I noticed that there were different colors of bands. Yeah, we banned all the birds we capture. Uh, we And we have captured now like 105 birds in the park. And of those, we have uh, put radio tags on about 70 birds now. Uh, we recycle some of the tags that get broken off or that uh, the bird dies. We recycle those tags and put them on a different bird. We just, just did that last week with a new bird here. Um, so we basically, our information is from 70 well-known birds and 100 or so less well-known. Thank you. Um, Karen Anderson asks, by feeding on the gut piles, presumably from hunters, are the ravens experiencing any lead poisoning or is that not an issue? It's an issue for sure, great question. Um, it has been studied in the Teton area explicitly because you would have to, you know, get the birds, take blood samples and have those analyzed for lead. We, we haven't done that. 
We've had a couple of suspicious deaths up in those foraging grounds that we suspect might be lead poisoned. Um, but we know from the studies done in the Tetons just south of us that uh, the ravens there and the eagles get significant uh, levels of lead poisoning. And I think because our birds are moving back and forth and exploiting many different things, maybe it's less of an effect uh, to be lethal at least because the mortality is actually fairly low on, on these birds. They also get exposed to nasty things at the sewage treatment plants and the dumps, of course, lots of um, hormone uh, inducers or uh, blockers and lots of other toxins um, at those places. And so there's lots of hazards to you know living close to people. Ravens seem to be pretty good at, at managing those, uh, I would say though. Uh, thank you again. Um, Kathy Daniel asks, what predates on ravens? So what predators do they have? Yeah, again, great question. The, the most important one in our study has been great horned owls. And that's because most of our birds that die, die at night at the roost. And um, the great horned owl is a very adept predator and abundant here in the West. And um, they're big enough and vicious enough to take a raven as they sleep. Some are killed by wolves at, at the uh, wolf kill sites, and some are killed by golden eagles around the kills as well. But great horned owls would be the number one enemy of the raven. I did not expect that answer myself. Um, Edgar Rivas asks, were you able to compare data of ravens relating to cougars, which you did, and grizzlies, or even wolverines in the high country? Wolverines are super rare uh, in Yellowstone. There's a few, uh, many more in Glacier, uh, where there is higher higher country, as as you say. Um, so no, and none of the wolverines are radio collared um, in Yellowstone. Grizzly bears are, and black bears are, and we've had uh, instances of them foraging at those kill sites, but. Those animals are often scavengers as well, and they're often taking wolf kills and uh, or taking uh, winter killed animals. And we'll have ravens and bears foraging together there, but um, not in the situation so much as predator scavenger like with the wolf raven. And it's more scavenger scavenger that's going on there. Um, so the the data on bears, the locational data is not nearly as frequent. And of course, it's only for about half of the year when the when the animals are not hibernating that they would be relevant for ravens. So we don't have as good of a handle, but we do know they compete for resources together. And often that's a, at a former wolf kill site as well. Um, uh, Catherine Cox had uh, written on here, do ravens make or use tools like the crows do? Not to our knowledge. Uh, we have seen them dropping rocks on uh, people that are approaching their nests. I've seen them chipping bark off at a, goal, at a bald eagle that was by a kill site. S probably most of that is what we call displacement behavior. They're just you know, frustrated and hitting something that they can hit, and it has this effect. It, it could be purpose, purposeful. They um, there have been observed using sticks to to get owls out of an area uh, one time, and that's about it. The crow that really is the tool user is a New Caledonian crow, and and they are experts at making and using tools. But other corvids nowhere near the um, tool use propensity that New Caledonia crows have. Hmm. Uh, Cheryl Snyderman asked about if there's um, any observation of ravens uh, and crows being collectors of random items. And they, she said she noticed a category of items being sold online called crow confetti, which is generally a, a jar of random items. 
So geared at uh, collecting the sparkly things or something, I guess. Yeah. There's lots of stories about magpies and, and crows, especially um, doing that, taking things. I, I go through a lot of those in the Gifts of the Crow book. There is these famous cases, a, a young kid in Seattle brought to my office one, one day, a whole pile of weird things that crows had collected, um, earrings, rings, um, shiny uh, bits of, of foil. So crows are pretty well known for picking up things like that. Ravens will pick up uh, balls of snow, bits of bone. They will wrestle and fight with those. They will chase each other for those prizes. But um, I don't see them pick up other uh, shiny objects other than looking at them as possible food around right. dumps and things as, as crows seem to do. Okay. Um, that seems to be all of them that were in the chat. Does anybody have any last minute questions they want to ask Dr. Marsliffs before we uh, end our, our show today? Probably getting on the later side. We thank you so much for, you for your presentation. It's been wonderful. So you um, Thanks a lot for the invitation and the interest. Thank you. All right. Well, you have a good evening. And you we'll too. stop this recording. Okay. Good night. Good night.